Okay, I'm going to give a quick geology class here about how gold and silver and other precious metals are formed. <clears throat> Along our coastal areas and the tectonic plates that form our planet, there are subdu subduction zones. These are usually along coastal areas where the land meets the ocean. The cooler ocean and land is slightly heavier than the continental land, and as the plates move and collide, the material within the ocean and, and the layers of silt and sediment under the ocean are pushed underneath this subduction zone and forced down deeper into the earth and recycled and heated. The land being slightly warmer uh, is more buoyant. As these subduction zones form, we have fissures in the earth, we have uh, faults, or, uh, fault zones where earthquakes and the, these subduction zones push together the plates of the earth, and they cause uplifts. From these zones, magma will work its way up towards the surface and form a magma chamber in these faults. Above the faults where the magma is forced up, it causes the land to bulge and to rise. If more magma comes in, it causes these magma chambers to, to bulge even more, it can cause cracks. High pressure magma can rise to the surface and form a volcano. As time goes on, as the volcano cools and heats and cools, these magma pockets, water is evaporated out. goes into solution and brings with it the minerals. Also along the Earth's surface we have a water table. This water gets down in here into the ground, works its way in and then comes back up too. And as what say one of these cracks is called is starts filling up with this hot solution and solidifies as time goes on if this entire area solidifies becomes a solidifies with mineral it becomes a vein so these these cracks can become veins with pressure of water, the evaporated water and the condensed water from magma chambers and from the water table seeking into the ground and then the minerals being extracted from the heat and they come back up into a vein. An earthquake can shear that vein. Um, the forces of, of erosion, these veins can become exposed to the surface. And, they've, and these exposed areas where these veins are at can be, is called an outcropping. Let's say this is a cave under the ground, and this is a, a vein. Let's say it's a quartz vein.
and not all the veins in this quartz might be the same. This could be more pure quartz, this could be very mineralized. These could occur from two different events. But let's say a miner comes along, he discovers an outcropping, he follows the vein, this quartz vein down into the ground and begins extracting the mineral from here and has it sampled and finds out that it's it's high in gold or silver. How do you find these these veins and these these outcroppings initially? Well, downstream there's river channels and side streams that come in and by panning and exploring these side channels you can start to find gold and silver and then you can follow that pay streak of gold and silver to where up, up uphill and when you quit getting gold and silver values then you you go uphill towards the outcroppings to discover where it's weathering out and where it is originating from okay that's just a very quick and simple lesson on where precious minerals come from howdy my fellow explorer and treasure hunters We've got a uh, snow day out here today, so I'm not able to get outside and do some of the things I wanted to do today. I'd planned an expedition to go look at a petroglyph panel today and get a little exercise. But instead, I decided to do a little video here about uh, prospecting and lo looking for precious minerals. It's something that I have an interest in. I think I inherited that interest from my my grandfather on my mom's side after he retired from uh, his dairy herd he had a big dairy herd up in in northern Utah in Cache Valley he his name was uh, Hiram Mon after he retired from this dairy herd he started prospecting and he ended up having some some mining operations on the Kimberly Mountain in central Utah on the Beaver Mountain Range. Anyway, while he was alive, he taught me a lot about prospecting and and gave me some different prospecting information, some books, and, and showed me some of the things that he was doing. And one of the things that he really enjoyed doing, and I enjoy doing as well, is, is getting out and exploring the geology that the country has to offer and looking for mineral deposits. Um, the best places to look for precious minerals, of course, is where they've been found before. That's a proven, proven areas. That takes less effort. A lot of people make a pretty good living finding old mines and going through the tailings using more modern methods of extraction to get those mineral values out. Uh, something that I enjoy more than going to the old workings is actually looking for areas that have never been mined before. Um, I guess in some circles they call this wildcatting, basically looking for minerals in areas that are unproven zones. Uh, I think there are many of these left still out there. Some of them are in the process of weathering out. Maybe earlier in the prospect, more in the heavy prospecting days, some of these outcroppings, um, some of these mineralized areas were not exposed to nature as much as they are today. The process of earthquakes and water moving and, and different types of erosion often leads to more modern discoveries. New technology in the way of uh, GPR and, and different types of mineral exploration, the core drilling, has opened up a lot of zones and areas that were previously unknown. Um, when you find mineralized areas or zones that are um, predominantly outcroppings or are areas where the land is shifted or or 
or moved and you can see different types of, of uh, seismic activity and different types of mineral that are that are in the soil. You can take you can take test samples and have them uh, analyzed to see what those minerals are. Now the, the method that I usually use is to do my own chemical analysis. Um, my grandfather gave to me um, some copies of Duke's Quick Qualitative Analysis and a short course in prospecting and mineral identification. And I've used the chemical tests in these manuals for many years to identify what the different minerals are. They're fairly inexpensive methods, uh, fairly quick. Once you have the, uh, the chemicals and the, the materials and test tubes and things necessary for doing the testing, it's, it's actually fairly straightforward and quick. Today we have um, X-ray spectrometry. Um, it's basically uh, electron microprobe analysis. Basically it's electron microprobe analysis. Uh, X-ray spectrometry or mass spectrometry which is used most commonly to identify what minerals are in the rocks, the host rock. Uh, the, the most accurate method of course is a, a fire assay which tests the through fire and, and, and separation it tests the precious minerals that are inside the host rock or inside the ore. Now the two types of uh, these assays there's the um, analytical which shows everything that's inside the sample and then there's the cum cumulative uh, assay which shows how much of the different minerals are inside that assay. But basically when you're out exploring and looking in different areas you come to a mineralized area or an outcrop and I'm going to put some some pictures and some examples of what some of these areas look like, some of these zones. You can take different samples. Basically um, a fist size sample and crush it down I like to use what I call a pipe crusher and um, I'll have an example of what a pipe crusher is. I take that into the field with me and when I find a good mineral sample I'll put it into a Ziploc baggie with a note with a 3x5 card inside the baggie with the sample and then when I get back to my truck or back home I will crush that sample up very fine pulverize it into fine powder and then I will use the quick quantitative or qualitative analysis to determine what whether there's gold, silver, lead or platinum or whatever else may be in that particular sample. And after you've taken enough of these samples and understand some of the properties of these minerals you will start to be able to see when you're in the field you'll have a pretty good idea of what your sample may contain and these can become the basis for finding a valuable mine or or filing a mining claim and actually being able to sell the claim to a a hard rock uh, miner somebody that's actually engaged in the mining or you can start processing and and uh, developing the mine yourself if that's something that interests you I just thought this might be helpful to somebody that's interested in in prospecting for mines and uh, getting into the hard rock mining mining scene. Um, I do have a couple of good claim prospects that uh, I'm looking at and I would actually like to uh, get a good miner somebody to come down and look at my claims before uh, I start doing a lot of work to see if they're actually viable. But it's interesting some of the ways that, that you can look for quartz deposits, um, fissures in the rock that have different colors of ore, such as uh, they call peacock ore, which are different colored rocks. 
outcroppings that are very orange or reddish in color that contain iron. One famous quote by the Spanish was that gold rides an iron horse. And iron load deposits are responsible for many, if not most, of the precious metal deposits that are found that are out there. Um, other things that you can look for are, are uh, cracks or crevices in the ground where groundwater has worked its way in and there's, there's a lot of uh, heavy mineralized um, soil. Different colors of clay can sometimes hold minerals. Um, if you find black sands, areas where you have heavy black sands can be a way, uh, an area where there are precious metals. Of course, there's a lot of prospecting channels out there or information that can be found on the internet or in mining books about how the old 49ers actually found their mines. They would prospect in streams and drainages, seasonal drainages, and they would follow the pay streaks of the precious metals up to the location where the metals quit, and then they would begin searching up hill to find where they started or where they originated from. And this is how most of the old mining claims, um, the old mines were found or discovered. Anyway, I hope that helps you out and gives you a little bit of information and maybe pitch your interest to look into it a little bit more. Yeah, here's the pipe mill. Got a bit handle. Got a stand so it stands. You got your plate welded on your bottom. It's not ground very good, but I'm gonna show you. This is a pretty hard rock. I don't know what it is, but put that in there, put my glasses on. <clears throat> Here, hold this for me. Video me pounding this. Okay. Get back so you can see the whole thing. Yeah, I am. Sometimes you get a chunk of stuff in there. <laughs> now I can keep on pounding that. I had water in the bottom there. If I didn't have water, it'd be a lot easier, but. Just keep pounding it in there and pounding it as fine as I want.